today I will be talking about organic synthesis. In particular, I will be looking and covering Edexcel's A2 Chemistry Unit 5.3 A to E. So in the exam, we may be asked to suggest a pathway for the synthesis of a particular molecule. And therefore, I decided to do a video summarizing um, some of the different reactions that were covered both at AS and A2, which can be useful. Um, organic synthesis allows us to make one compound from another, and it's very important uh, when it comes to designing medications, and it is also useful um, in terms of improving uh, natural substances, for example, if they have um, undesired side effects, we can then modify the functional groups and often get rid of the side mm, of the unwanted side effects. So, first of all, let's talk about why organic synthesis is important. Well, historically, um, most drugs that were produced came from plants and it was very hard to make large quantities, therefore research was conducted uh, in order to find more available reagents, but also to be able to produce large quantities. So we can use um, organic synthesis to change a natural product, as I already said, so to improve the quality or to reduce the side effects. A good example would be aspirin. Um, it was once called um, salicylic acid and it came from the bark of a willow tree. However, it caused uh, mouth and stomach irritation. So the functional groups were modified and uh, it does not have the undesired side effects anymore. So if you take aspirin, modern day aspirin, um, you will not, you should really not have mouth or stomach irritation due to the improvements. Let's talk also about the synthesis of chiral drugs. So many drugs will have a chiral carbon atom and a chiral carbon atom is represented here. So we can see um, the chiral center. Basically a chiral center or a carbon will have four different groups attached to it, which will make it chiral. Um, so also drugs are of, often designed to be stereospecific, meaning that only one of the optical isomers will have a therapeutic effect. So in the modern day synthesis, we try to produce only a single optical isomer to reduce the risk of the body having undesired side effects to the other optical isomer. However, in practice, it is quite difficult to separate optical isomers and it can be very expensive. So I have two examples here. So the first one is ibuprofen only one of the isomers um, of ibuprofen is actually effective as a pain relief and anti-inflammatory drug. You buy ibuprofen from the pharmacist, it, the ibuprofen tablet comes as a racemic mixture and the two isomers are not separated. Um, and that is because um, the other enantiomer is converted in the body by isomerase, which is a biological enzyme, into the active form. Therefore, there is no need to separate um, the two isomers in this case. Another very famous example is thalidomide, um, which was used in the 1950s and it was prescribed to pregnant women who were suffering from, from morning sickness. However, um, it was later discovered that one optical isomer relieved the morning sickness symptoms However, the other one caused very severe and horrific, horrific birth defects. When you take the medication, the body then converts one isomer into the other and in this case separating the two isomers would not work. Another example um, that I came across was cocaine. Cocaine was once used as an anesthetic and but we now know that it has harmful side effects and it's highly addictive. Um, therefore, a lot of research was conducted and a new drug called Novocaine was um, discovered. And it's better because, because it has no side effects. And so Novocaine was used as a local anesthetic for a lot of times for, in dentistry, for example. And again, further research was then again conducted and we now have Lidocaine, which is shown here on the right 
which we now use um, for minor procedures or when you go to the dentist. I found this diagram and I think it's quite useful because it covers pretty much all the reactions that uh, we do in AS and A2. I have a separate slide on benzene reactions, so this covers alkenes, alcohols, um, carbonyls, acids, esters, amides, amines, nitriles, and halogen alkanes. A lot of times we'll be presented with a with a molecule that we haven't seen before, but by recognizing the functional groups, uh, you should be able to say how um, that particular molecule was synthesized. So the common transformations that are very useful in organic chemistry would be uh, when an alkene becomes a halogenoalkane. So this is done with a hydrogen halide, for example hydrogen bromide, and you just simply mix the gases at room temperature and you should get a halogenoalkane. Um, also, alkenes can be converted to primary alcohols, and this is done with concentrated sulfuric acid and water, and we will get a primary alcohol. And a primary alcohol is basically, <clears throat> you can see here that the OH group is attached to a carbon, um, and that carbon is only attached to one other carbon, making it a primary alcohol. So from a primary alcohol, we can then um, oxidize it to go to an aldehyde. And in order to oxidize it to an aldehyde, we would use um, acidified potassium dichromate in dilute sulfuric acid. And we would add the oxidizing agent to the hot alcohol and allow the aldehyde to distill off as it is formed. So we will distill the aldehyde if we desire the aldehyde. So, um, however, if we want to oxidize it, if we leave the aldehyde in the mixture without distilling it, um, it will then uh, undergo further oxidation and it will become a carboxylic acid. And again, we would use acidified potassium dichromate in dilute sulfuric acid and we would heat the mixture under reflux, in which case we will get um, the carboxylic acid. So let's go back to the secondary alcohol. So again, a secondary alcohol is when the carbon which is carrying the OH group is attached to two other carbons. And secondary alcohols, when they're oxidized, um, they're oxidized to ketones, which is shown here. And once again, uh, we would also use acidified potassium dichromate and dilute sulfuric acid. And in this case, we don't need to worry about distilling anything because ketones will be the ultimate product and they will not um, undergo any further transformations. So a tertiary alcohol is um, when the carbon which is carrying the OH group is attached to three other carbons and there is no oxidation there. So usually we don't really worry about tertiary alcohols. Um, so let's say, um, so both ketones and aldehydes are known as carbonyls. So that is that they contain a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. With the ketones, the double bonded oxygen is usually in the middle of the molecule, whereas in an aldehyde, it's usually on the end because you need um, the double bonded oxygen uh, to be bonded to a carbon which is also carrying the hydrogen. So that's sort of the structural difference between the two. Um, we can do two tests to try and distinguish between um, carbonyls. The general test we can do to confirm whether we have a carbonyl would be to use 2,4-dinitrophenylhydrazine, uh, 2,4-DNPH in which case we will see an orange precipitate and that will confirm that we have a carbonyl. However, it doesn't tell us whether we have a ketone or an aldehyde. So in order to distinguish um, between those two, we can use Tollens reagent, uh, which, is, which contains silver. So with an aldehyde, you will have a silver mirror precipitate or a gray precipitate, which of, of, sol of solid silver forming, which will confirm that we have an aldehyde because the ketone will have no reaction with the tollens. Um, so that's a way of distinguishing between the two. So let's look at carboxylic acids. So carboxylic acids, um, the test for a carboxylic acid 
we can use we could use sodium carbonate um, and add that to the acid and we should see some bubbling or fizzing uh, which well usually that would be CO2 and we can confirm that by using lime water so then carboxylic acids can be converted to acid chlorides uh, usually we use phosphorus pentachloride in this case you can also use SOCl2 um, and you just basically mix the dry reagents to get an acid chloride. Um, acid chlorides um, basically have a carbon double bonded oxygen and a Cl instead of the OH and for example this this molecule here would be called ethanoyl chloride. So with acid chlorides we can then um, transform it either into an amide or, or, or into an ester. So to convert it into an amide we can use ammonia, aqueous ammonia and the conditions would be to mix it at room temperature to get an amide. And we can also convert acid chlorides into esters um, which can be done um, by adding an alcohol to the mixture. So we've now looked um, at this diagram sort of going from alkenes to alcohols, aldehydes, acids and so on. Um, we could also look at this diagram from a backward direction. So let's say we had a carboxylic acid uh, and we wanted to get an aldehyde, what would we do? Well, we could use a very strong, we could use a reducing agent. Uh, we could either use lithium aluminium anhydride or NaBH4 which would then transform a carboxylic acid into an aldehyde and we could also use the same reagents to reduce an aldehyde back to a primary alcohol. Um, the same reducing agent can also be used for um, the reduction of a ketone back to a secondary alcohol. Another thing I wanted to mention about alkenes in the beginning here was the test that we can carry out to confirm that we have a carbon carbon double bond and we can use bromine water shown here uh, which will make which will produce a color change so the solution will go from sort of a brown orange color to a colorless solution which is a very common way to test for a double bond. Let's also look at the production of nitriles and amines so once we've got a halogen alkane we can use ammonia to produce an amine or we can use um, KCN to produce a nitrile. So potassium cyanide uh, in this case will react with primary, secondary and tertiary halogen alkanes. Um, the conditions that are required need to heat the mixture under reflux and it needs to be in a solution of ethanol and water. And this is a very useful reaction because it increases the carbon chain length by one carbon and we get a nitrile. Uh, and then a nitrile can then be converted to a primary amine or hydrolyzed to a carboxylic acid. I haven't put it on the diagram here but um, I think it's quite important to know about the hydrogen cyanide uh, reacting with both aldehydes and ketones. Um, which forms a compound with both the CN group and the OH group on the same carbon atom. We would need to have the reagents, uh, we would need to mix them in the presence of a buffer at pH 8 and the pH causes some of the hydrogen cyanide to be converted into cyanide ions which are basically the catalyst um, for this reaction. And another thing that I didn't put on the diagram is um, what do we do if we want to decrease the carbon chain length? We can use the iodoform reaction in which case we have iodine and sodium hydroxide reacting with alcohols that have a methyl group or a carbonyl compound again that has a methyl group and then um, we basically get the product which is called iodoform which is the old name uh, but now we would call it uh, triodomethane, so it'll be a carbon with three iodines and one hydrogen attached to it. So for example, we can convert propantool to propanone um, to give us sodium methanoate. And then for the carboxylic acid, um, we can form it from the salt by adding aqueous sulfuric or hydrochloric acid and the same goes for aromatic ketones. In this case here we've got the benzene ring 
So let's first look at nitration. So nitration is when we are trying to get nitrobenzene. So nitrobenzene, the nitro stands for the NO2 group, which we're trying to attach to the benzene ring. The reagents would be concentrated nitric acid in um, sulfuric acid, and we would mix uh, the benzene with the concentrated sulfuric acid at about 55 to 60 degrees to to get our nitrobenzene as shown here. Um, then we also have chlorination but we can also have bromination um, the principle is the same where we're trying to either get a chlorobenzene or bromobenzene so in this case we've got a chlorobenzene because we've got the chlorine group attached. So the reagent would be for bromination, we would use liquid bromine and we would dry dry it with with iron to form FeBr3, which is then the catalyst. Acylation, which is known as fetal crafts acylation. So for example, um, we can go from benzene to phenyl ethanone. So the reagent would be um, ethanol chloride, which is our um, acid chloride, and it has to be dry in the presence of anhydrous aluminium chloride catalyst. We also have alkylation. So, for example, um, the R stands for a side chain. Let's say we want to add an ethyl group in which case we will then get ethyl benzene the reagent we would need that we would need to use would be bromoethane again it has to be in, in dry conditions in the presence of an anhydrous aluminium chloride catalyst